We would like to welcome you all to the Community Violence Intervention Addressing Gangs, Coordinating a Comprehensive Response webinar. As a reminder, this webinar is being brought to you by the National Gang Center, which is supported by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. The National Gang Center exists to help communities implement comprehensive solutions to prevent gang violence, reduce gang involvement, and suppress gang-related crime. For more information about the Gang Center, we recommend visiting our website at nationalgangcenter.ojp.gov. I will now go ahead and turn it over to our moderator for today, Dr. Celeste Wojtelewicz of the National Gang Center to begin our presentation. Welcome, Celeste. Thank you, Sterling. And welcome again, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for this webinar. As we know, youth violence in the US is a cr critical societal problem with wide ramifications for youth, families, schools, and communities. The CDC estimates that each day, more than a thousand youth are admitted to hospitals with assault injuries. And for non-Hispanic Black and African-American youth, homicide is a leading cause of death. Such is the magnitude of the problem that those of us involved in addressing youth violence need to deploy proven best practices to mitigate the problem. Among these best practices, and probably an overarching best practice, is the development of a pro of strong program infrastructure and effective project management. Through the course of this webinar um, and at the conclusion, the um, we, we hope that the participants uh, take back the following, be able to explain the importance of selecting the appropriate agency to serve as a lead for the initiative. And this is important not only for um, anybody that's starting a program, but if you're working on any type of community violence intervention project, uh, this is really going to be key. Identify the difference between fiscal responsibilities and day-to-day -day operations management. And then last but not least, outline the critical role of the project coordinator. And I see that in the chat, there are people uh, joining us from various parts of the country. And uh, from what I saw is people are joining from different types of organizations. And I think this will be of interest to anyone that is working on a project or will be developing one. So next, uh, next slide, please. So as we look at this, what is involved with coordinating a community response um, to violence, to community violence? Um, as you can see from this graphic here, the community is at the center, but it, it entails implementation of your initiative, whatever, based on an assessment, that would be whatever your assessment is in the community. Uh, community assessment, it could be something that's related to uh, violence that you suspect may be gang or group violence. And from there, you would look at implementing your um, program. From there, you would uh, look at, and obviously, if you're identifying any type of problem, you have probably already have people in the community, uh, leaders in the community that have seen this as an, as an issue and want to address the, the problem. So you may have a steering committee or an advisory board that is leading the way. And the steering committee would generally be made of those individuals that are in leadership positions and, and not only in agencies and formal agencies and local agencies, such as the mayor's office or um, probation office, let's say, or um, an employment, uh, employment agency for working with at-risk youth, but also it would meet, entail somebody from the community, community leadership at this level. And that's really important. Um, you would also have a program coordinator, as you can see from the graph, and then you would have an assessment work group or a research partner, possibly. It doesn't always happen that way, but that might be, a, that might be the way that your uh, initiative works, works out when you're building out a big, uh, big initiative that requires some research, some assessment of the issues in the community. And from there, you would look at your prevention, intervention and suppression activities. This may involve street outreach. It may involve a multidisciplinary uh, team that's working to address 
issues of violence in the community. And as I talk, as we talk about prevention and intervention and suppression, um, we're also talking about just account the basic accountability, uh, not necessarily, it doesn't always have to mean enforcement, but just social control, ability to um, work with the youth in the, in the community. And as a result, um, bring down the violence in the community. And it, it really does uh, come down to having systemic changes, systematic changes, and working together in a multidisciplinary, uh, with a multidisciplinary team. Next slide, please. So where to start? And as I mentioned, some of you may have already started an initiative, um, and some of you may be trying to sustain a current initiative that's related to gang, uh, whether it's gang violence, whether it's um, youth violence in general, it could be gun violence. Um, whatever that initiative may be, I, it's always a good plan to start thinking about sustainability. So um, and what we're gonna be talking about here is the need for um, building your program so that from the start, you're looking to sustain uh, the initiative beyond any kind of, maybe it be federal funding or state funding uh, to where it can, it can um, grow in the, in the community and it can support the youth that you're trying, that you're uh, attempting to serve. Next slide, please. So what do you look for in um, an elite agency? Uh, these are things that we all have to think about when we're looking at any type of violence reduction initiative. We want to make sure that the lead agency has experience and credibility. So who do the, who do the people in the community trust? If you look at any kind of initiative that's dealing with youth uh, violence and youth violence reduction, um, th they're Pretty like there's a pretty high likelihood that you'll be working with youth in some capacity, or there will be interactions with youth in some capacity. So, who in the community is trustworthy? Is it a public agency? Is it a private agency? Is it a nonprofit agency? Um, along with that, you're wanting to you will want to look at the infrastructure for sharing information. Whenever we talk about a multidisciplinary team, we're talking about people from different different disciplines working together and there is often mistrust about how the information will be shared. There's also some challenges with confidentiality. It may be that um, there, certain agencies are unable to share uh, information regarding the youth. And uh, when I'm talking about information sharing here, it's really for the purposes of intervention with with youth to uh, support violence reduction in the communities that you're uh, experiencing a high rate of violence. Uh, and so those are things that you have to keep in mind when you look at any type of lead agency. You'd want to look at the capacity to manage project funds. Who's capable of managing those funds? Is it going to be a large agency, a smaller agency? Who has the experience? Who's had the prior experience working with, with funding? And who has proven to be very reliable in that uh, management of those funds? And then the administrative framework. Which agency? There's a lot of dollars that go into, and we know there are a lot of costs associated with running any type of initiative. For any of you that are on this, um, participating participating in this webinar today who are in the role of administering uh, any kind of project, you know that there are a lot of behind the, scene, behind the scenes uh, costs, let's say, that go into uh, running a program effectively. And um, so you have to kind of take that, you have to take that into consideration. Some of the things that a community-based organization may have to uh, spend money on, maybe a larger organization can absorb those costs. And then the capacity to manage grant administration. For any of you out there who have ever worked with a grant, you know there's a lot that goes into managing a grant. There's a lot of reporting that is involved. There is a lot of um, 
uh, finances that financial accounting that is that is involved and so you have to have all those pieces in place and these are things to consider and throughout the the course of this webinar uh, with our next presenter and then the panelist discussion we'll have an opportunity to go more in depth about this and look at some of the challenges and um, benefits of working with different types of organizations so next next slide please so these, um, these are just types of lead agencies for consideration. Um, and some of you may already be in these agencies and can maybe some of the questions later on at the end of the day, at the end of this webinar, I should say, um, you may have some questions related to that or some comments. Uh, if we look at the first lead agency, that's a school district. So what are some of the advantages? Uh, if you're working with a, a school district, an advantage may be the buy-in from school administrators to ensure local school participation on the intervention team. And the intervention team, if any of you have participated in some of the previous webinars, it's really the, the, the core team. They're working to bring, bring together a case plan, bringing intervention services for the youth that they're working with. And um, they can be the probation team. It can be probation, I'm sorry, proba uh, representative from probation. Um, police, outreach workers, uh, an employment agency, mental health counseling, and maybe a school, obviously somebody from the schools. That's just to give you a brief example if you didn't have the benefit of attending some of the previous webinars. Um, so again, the advantages, access to comprehensive student and school level data. Uh, they're large enough to absorb the project once other funds are spent and access to financial and business management support. And then as we look at it, uh, disadvantages, a school district may be unwilling to provide services to out of school youth. And sometimes we've seen that as, a, as an issue because um, a school-based program is, is a school-based program. And, and there may be schools out there that can um, kind of uh, go beyond that role, but in many cases, it may just be they're working strictly with school, in school youth. Uh, district's policies may bog down decision making and then hiring policies may make it difficult for school districts to employ outreach staff. We know that um, outreach staff and many of you um, who've experienced this or who've worked with out hiring outreach workers may know that there is a vetting process and sometimes there's really a strict uh, strict background check while others may have a little bit more flexibility. So those are some things to consider when you're looking at schools. A local service provider, this could be a um, community-based organization, they have working knowledge of the target area. They're probably in the target area or they're working with youth and families who are in the target area. So they have a very good um, understanding of the pulse of the community and they have experience with community planning and action. Um, one of the, or it's perhaps some of the disadvantages may be private um, providers may lack the clout with governmental agencies. Um, they may not have, you know, the be seen in the light, unfortunately, that they should be. Um, and gang programming may not be given a, a priority in, in their agency because we know community-based organizations are often dealing with multiple uh, multiple programs and working with families on various things from provide, you know, outreach on food, it may be uh, mental health services, it may just run the gamut and they may be working with prevention and intervention activities. So they wear a lot of hats. And these organizations also may lack the organizational or the administrative structure to manage the funds and grants um, because there, it does require a, a large capacity to handle um, various grants that are of a large size. Uh, next slide, please. If we look at state agencies, um, an advantage again, resource and credibility, expertise in grant management and administration, 
and then again, access to financial and business management. Um, the, the disadvantages, the agency be, may be located away from the actual project activity. Sometimes they, they don't have a real good relationship with what's happening on the ground. And they may be perceived as outsiders, um, again, with, with no connection to the community. Uh, and there is a lack of awareness of local politics and historical issues. And we all know that this is very important for running any type or managing any type of program because uh, those that that is really key to understanding the population you're working with. So law, law enforcement, um, an advantage, and we have um, seen programs work with law enforcement, so there can be advantages, obviously, and disadvantages. So the involvement of a law enforcement agency uh, you'd have them uh, involved in the planning and the implementation, and there's a process for place for crime and gang information sharing. Uh, many times, uh, programs that are based in law enforcement agencies or connected to law enforcement agencies have access to real-time data, so they would know perhaps what's happening with youth that they're serving, not, again, for suppression purposes, but they may know uh, if, if there's an exchange of information, they may know what's, what has happened to you. Uh, sometimes what you'll find with the data is that you could find actually that a youth was a victim of a crime and you could find that out and that in real time and that could help you with intervention purposes. Um, there's also a process for play in place for crime and gang information sharing, greater access to daily updates regarding criminal activity and access again to um, financial and business management support. Um, the disadvantages, outreach staff may be wary of being too closely associated with law enforcement. And I think that's, um, that's something that um, will be discussed throughout this webinar today. Um, community members may have difficulty understanding the role of the project personnel. So again, we're talking about their different roles. They're, uh, I think it, if done correctly, everyone's looking to do, to intervene with the youth and to protect the community. But there are maybe misperceptions, there may be a wariness, uh, people may not, not want to feel comfortable sharing information. So I would add to that, that it may take a lot longer for them to develop the trust that's necessary um, to move the project forward. Um, but if done well, you know, it can, it could work, it could work out well um, in the end. Personnel may be perceived as this interested again, that I've just spoken to that as inter interested in arresting or incarcerating uh, the youth that you're working with. And if you're working with groups or gangs, uh, even more, um, there's even more, more um, maybe uh, hesitancy um, with outreach to uh, work with law enforcement. Um, next slide, please. And uh, that leads me to the prosecutor or other criminal justice entities. Um, the advantages, their, their ability to leverage the participation of law enforcement agencies. So they have a lot of clout and they can um, access, they have access to police incident reports on law enforcement data, which again is, is critical for intervention, for um, also looking at alternatives. Um, if you're looking at alternatives to um, in, uh, going to into detention, um, access to financial and business management support. Disadvantages, um, personnel may be perceived as interested only in prosecuting incarcerating gang members. And the agency may not have a strong connection to the target community. And uh, again, similar to uh, law enforcement, may, there may be a history of distrust between uh, criminal justice entities and service providers. And um, so again, this, this really depends on the local context. And uh, this is just a broad overview of advantages and disadvantages. Um, last but not least is city government. And um, so with city get government, there are advantages. You have access to key personnel in city departments and elected officials, quite important and access to sensitive data from law enforcement. Again, uh, this would be for inter intervention purposes and also for um, the, the ease. I would say with all of these that where we talked about data from law enforcement, this is also very critical for any type of assessment. Uh, the ease maybe with which you can get data for 
assessments or for um, for grant funding, just to have it in in real time and 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 maybe not as difficult to um, to access the information that you need for your program. And then credibility and buy-in from city agencies. Um, and uh, again, access to financial and business management and support. And then again, for um, city government, there's shifts in political leadership that can destabilize the project and city policies and or budget constraints may make it difficult to hire personnel. And um, with all of these, as I mentioned, there are certain agencies you really have to take into considera consideration, especially if you're working with outreach staff, it's the ease of hiring staff and finding the right staff uh, for this type of project. So if you're working with a gang initiative or group initiative where you're working with youth that are in, involved and, and, um, and you want to have somebody that has, has a, a life experiences, um, it may be, there may be some uh, blocks that you have to overcome to um, hire them. And I, the panelists will be talking about that today as well. Um, so all these things are very important. Um, project management is very important as well. And um, so with that, um, I have the pleasure now of introducing our, our next speaker, and Mr. Robert David Sr. Um, Robert David has had um, more than 25 years of experience in strategic planning and development with a focus on building relationships with key stakeholders, managing um, managing project delivery, designing collaborative strategies, and coaching individuals to success. He currently serves as the Youth and Gang Violence Prevention Coordinator for the City of Danville, Virginia, and is responsible for the creation of Project Imagine, a community violence inter intervention collaborative model to de decrease youth violence. So, um, Robert, um, and if you'd like to add anything to the introduction, by all means, go ahead. Um, but now the floor is yours, Robert. You did a great job, Celeste. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I came to, to Danville uh, by way of, uh, unfortunately, some serious situations with, with gang violence, um, much like many cities in the South where textiles uh, began to go into decline and people began to leave uh, particular areas. There was a lot of poverty. So in 2016, 2017, uh, Danville, which I think had a population at the time of about 42,000, they had 31 homicides. And many of those homicides uh, were gang related. And they were under um, uh, young men, young men of color under 21 years old. So the city of Danville, uh, the municipalities, they formed a task force. Uh, the city manager and the city council were on board and they sought out a model and that model that they developed or they sought out was a comprehensive gang model. And in the comprehensive gang model, uh, there's a recommendation to hire a youth and gang violence prevention coordinator. And so that's how I, I got to this point in Danville, uh, facing some, uh, some serious situations. Uh, as I said, Project Imagine was birthed out of those situ serious situations because much like many other small towns or even some larger places, uh, there was no budget. So uh, what we did have, we, we had a lot of resources, but uh, many of those individuals were siloed as meaning that uh, I'm afraid to collaborate with other people because you're gonna take what's mine. And so it had to come in and really kind of uh, find individuals who were willing to work. And a lot of people, good people doing a lot of good things, mind you, but they were not communicating. So we came in, or I came in because it was just me. I remember the first day they, I had a real nice cherry wood desk and a huge office, but no budget. <laughs> and I was uh, given the task to, to uh, deal with some of this gang violence that was going on. So the first thing that I know is that relationships are key. So my very first day, uh, I went out into the street and began to talk to different people in the community. Now, mind you, my background is maybe different from others. I've been, in, uh, I've worked in juvenile probation, adult probation, the prison system, um, and uh, way back in the day, if you guys are out there as old as I am, I used to be a bouncer for rappers back in the 90s, Kwame and Special Ed. So I had that background of, of going out into the community. And so without any budget, we had, I had to develop relationships indirectly. And what I found out was there, is, uh, there were federal dollars called the WIOA program, WIOA, which exists in every, every, every state. And they ran a program 
that uh, provided stipends for a young men 16 to 24. They would pay them $10 an hour, uh, tax-free. It didn't affect the, 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 the uh, parents uh, rent or uh, EBT cards. It didn't affect any of that. So essentially it was tax-free money and they could work, they could make up to $3,600. But the problem was that they didn't have that relationship in the community to connect with that population. So they had been sending hundreds of thousands of dollars back to the federal government for years because that connection to the community wasn't there because there was a lack of trust. So uh, what I did was I talked talk to the city manager. I work out of the city manager's office uh, with a lead program. Um, is, is city manager's office. I talked with him and we, we uh, created five jobs, public works, uh, parks and recreation, and, uh, and, the, and the library and had those specifically set out, not just for working, but to do a, a somewhat of a, a workforce readiness mentor program where while they're working, we understand that they don't have that work history, but uh, we're willing, uh, the, the supervisor were willing to help. So we pull those guys in, the population was already there, the Department of Juvenile Justice, Juvenile Probation, they had the population. And in Virginia, we have mentors who work with someone at risk youth. So the population was there. So I made connection with those guys. And then the money was there, which is from workforce ready. And so really all I, I began to be was, was the conduit. Uh, one of the things they, that when I first got here and started doing this, the young boys started calling me the plug. If you guys in the streets, you know what that means or to connect because I really didn't have any, have any, have any uh, money or anything to give them, but access and access. I find out now, which is my motto access is <laughs> access is uh, the new currency. If you have access, you don't need, need money. So making those connections, we would create that program. I started in June and we had the program up and running uh, by October. And uh, we, did our first five youth and uh, it, it was really successful. Uh, new slide, please. And so Project Imagine, as I said, we I ran that from 2018 to 2020 uh, just by myself and we were able to get some funding, but what it consisted of was a nine week program. And why was it nine weeks? Because that's what the we owe a money would, would pay for. They would pay for nine weeks, 40 hours a week and those individuals would get that money. And so once we paired them to the workstation, but prior to that, I understood that some of these people were coming off raw, never had any experience. I didn't really have the staff, personnel, or, or the resources to do a, 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 a large scale orientation, but I did want to make that contact. Number one, to let them know the, that um, they have some support when they go on this job. And then number two, to develop that relationship. So every youth that came into the program had contact with me and contact numbers. I was able to go out and do visits on their jobs and things like that. So we had a three hour orientation. I would have like the bank come in or in uh, uh, life skills and just talk about things, try to prepare them. Um, and so it was workforce ready and they shadowed. And, and I, can't, I can't lie, full disclosure, not everyone worked 40 hours a week, of course not. But that wasn't the idea. The idea was to create that relationship, uh, and which we'll talk about later on in, at, in the presentation, is about relationship is key. It, it is everything when you're doing this, doing this work. And so uh, the referrals came from the school system. Uh, they came from community members. They came from um, churches. Uh, they came from DSS. But the, the key here is that you had to create that environment if you're starting from scratch and depending on where you are, you have to build a relationship with those stakeholders and you have to be seen. And the history of Danville was that they would always bring someone in and who would stay a short amount of time, uh, take the money and leave, but never produce any results. So this, this community was traumatized. So what they wanted was to see was sustainability. Um, and one of the things that happens uh, is when I first came in, I met a bunch of uh, re-entering citizens and they were peeling this in the communities. They were big time, whatever, back in the 90s and 2000s, but they had a lot of respect in the community. And so I met with like seven of them and we were talking about what we're doing. Little did I know, a year later, they told me, they said, you know, we listen to you, but we're waiting to see what you what you were gonna do. And because I was consistent and did what I said I was gonna do, they gave me st street credit in the community because then they made the message for Project Imagine was they're, they're legitimate people. So relationships are key. I'll keep saying it because it is. Um, 
from Project Imagine and develop that relationship, we was also we were also able to create something called Project Rebuild. We understand that young this generation doesn't want to go to school for a long time. So I connected with the, the community college and they had a construction program, but it was a year and a half. Well, I, I worked with the community college and the dean over there, and we condensed that program into a 10-day certification. Mind you, it was like six hours a day, but after that 10 days, they were like certified laborers, and then we uh, uh, proceeded to assist, uh, attach them to interns. And I think uh, the first group, we graduated seven. And these guys are fresh off the couch onto the certification. So through the relationships of starting Project Imagine and, and getting that, uh, being legitimate in the community, uh, we were able to do that. Now the 21 serve just speaks to Project Imagine. Then we have the additional seven from Project Rebuild. Uh, and out of those 21, 85% uh, program graduation graduated from the program and so the great thing about that is if dealing with this population many times uh we may not understand and just don't think about it that most of these young men have had losses their whole life and their parents haven't seen haven't seen them succeed so anytime they would finish those um finish finish the graduation or finish the nine weeks we would have a graduation and we would ask that their parents and their friends and and everyone whoever wants to come and, and we would give them something to eat and, and and just celebrate them and and honestly really emotional times because um as i said i was walking up the stairs behind one young man and he'd been kicked out of school and and all these things had charges and he was talking to another young guy and he said you know what they're graduating today but he said you know at least i got this that's the impact. Those are the, 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 the qualitative things that you can't necessarily put on paper, but how you uh, synergistically impact and impact the uh, community. So 85% probation compliance. Uh, some of those guys paid off, paid off their probation. Uh, there weren't any new charges and 90% new charges. So I, I mean, for starting off going from where we were in 2017 and 16 with 31 homicides and many of those, uh, you know, gang related to, to, to this point. And of course, this is coupled with law enforcement and what they're doing. But Project Imagine, I came to that name because the, the image uh, or, or the motto for Danville was reimagine that. And I asked the city manager, how can you reimagine something that you never had an image of? So this is to get them to see that you can be something and that it's something great inside of you. You just need something to get a win. Sometimes we just need, need a win. And, um, and and that's what Project Imagine was. So. Because we, you know, we we were diligent and we worked with what we had with little money, uh, we're able to get some funding from OJJDP, and uh, I was uh, able to hire two, three outreach workers, and that that has changed everything. Thank you. That has changed everything from May. Uh, from May, we were able to, and we, we have on the caseload now, we have 26 youth uh, from from May, and we're able to do outreach workers which are credible messages and interrupters so now with the outreach workers and the reason i was able to get the outreach workers because if, if you're looking at the video and you see that the person is standing beside me on the end i got on the mask the guy that's standing beside me he was one of the re-entering citizens and he was one of the guys that was watching me and he's also because we did what we said and he saw the sincereness of what we're doing he put it out in the community that this guy is okay and so with that we were able to get interrupters volunteer interrupters and create this thing we call the safe haven and the safe haven because uh, once we got the once we got the outreach workers i was able to put them out in areas in the community and so he has a lot of respect and knew a lot of people and so he kind of set set at the barbershop because in this particular area that's where all the gang members go and so what, what started happening was they would come to him or come to the barber and ask how can we get a job how can we do this and so we made the barbershop officially a project imagine safe haven meaning that you don't have to come up town or you don't have to look for us you don't have to suffer the embarrassment if you tell the barber the barber tells him and then we go from there and it has worked um, um, it's been amazing and the barber also agreed to be an interrupter where he's he stopped some some things that should have happened some shootings and um it, it's just been an amazing thing i wish i i wish i had two hours i could easily talk about this for the next four hours but i know i have limited time limit so with that now that i have a, a staff and um i was i was able to do something more so we created a 15 hour orientation and the first class that we do is and we've been running one one a month so the first class the first class is strength-based goals assessment why because 
you can't focus on their negative impact because we all know the bad things or the negative things they've done. We need to focus their goals based on their strength. So we get a Clifton strength based assessment and then we take those goals and we give the goal, we, we uh, talk to, about those goals and then we have them set their goals. Ultimately, the goal is to decrease gang violence, but anything that we can do in order to decrease gang violence that is going to be relevant to them is, is what we uh, uh, set up because it's their plan and they have to work it. We just assist. So we do in those 15 hours, is, we do it over five days. And uh, through funding, we were able to give them $150 stipend. And uh, we have a big graduation and, and it's awesome. And so now we, we're getting more community referrals. Uh, and because now that we have a connection in the community, because uh, my outreach workers have a deeper depth than I can go. And one of my outreach workers in UOC is 23 years old and he comes out of that lifestyle. Uh, he's connected to basketball. And so uh, two, three months ago here in Danville, the Parks and Rec uh, decided, well, because of funding, well, not because of funding, but because of the pandemic and hiring, they were not able to do a basketball league. So what did we do? We pulled all our youth together and now we're running a five week basketball league. And we've got, we've got North side and South side, which is, you know, how they do it here and, and different sets of gangs playing together. But the key to that is that we have OGs who are the coaches and um, we have individuals who are strong in the community, men that are coming out and they're coaching and they come to the practices and we just played our uh, second game. And, and some of these guys will never play organized basketball again, but they come to practice twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday on time. We haven't had a fight. We haven't had any yelling or screaming. That's the benefit of, of making those connections and um, having outreach workers because now they are the credible messengers because they have respect in the community and everyone knows them. And so even, and also we were also able to do re-entry support because uh, we will con we work with Department of Juvenile Justice, have an MOU and we con we contact the youth before he comes out and we do a, uh, a Zoom with the parents at their home. So the, so the youth can see that we're already engaged. Uh, the, one of the major things is we're getting referrals from gang members. Guys who are in the street owe the gang members. They don't want their little brother or whatever to uh, get caught up in that. That's what we're doing. And so we're able to get uh, referrals from those guys, which is huge. Uh, we're collaborating in the community with community college, creating employment. We're com uh, collaborating with, uh, actually we have a semi-pro, I mean, a, a, with like a triple-A baseball team, the Autobots. And we've just come into an MOU where they're going to hire some of our guys to work and they're going to do a Project Imagine Day. And all this has to do with developing relationships. Next slide, please. Good afternoon. My name is Curtis Artis. I work for Project Imagine as a youth and gang violence prevention outreach worker. Today, I came here to talk about the impact that Project Imagine has had on the city of Danville and the youth of Danville. I feel that Project Imagine has given the city, as well as the youth of Danville, uh, a newfound hope. Before, it was almost like we was lost. We didn't know where to go with these youth. Now, with Project Imagine, we're giving the youth an unconditional commitment to help them reach their goals to be productive in society. Hi, my name is Shakiva Frazier, youth outreach worker for Project Imagine in the city of Danville. I believe that it has been a great impact that Project Imagine has had on our youth as well as our community, being that we're able to provide direct resources. We're able to go into the home, we're able to continually communicate with the youth, and we have so many community organizations who have chipped in to help us. It's not a one-person job, it is a community job, and the youth have um, witnessed how the community has rallied around and provided resources. And so, because of this, I believe it's a great impact that we're going to see and continue to see coming from Project Imagine. Thank you. My name is Reginald Jeffries, and I'm a youth outreach worker for Project Imagine through the city of Danville. And it's such a joy to be a part of this organization because we're able to go inside of the community, um, into the schools, into the homes of, of the young people here in our city and be able to give them a real work, real structure, uh, positive influence, um, be able to, to share stories about how we grew up in this community and the things that we were able um, to do to make it out um, and to be successful. And I think anytime you can uh, have someone of my age uh, as close to those kids working with them and giving them that extra push and that extra motivation to reach beyond the stars and to see things that they never thought they would see. 
Um, it's always a joy and a pleasure to do. And so um, I hope that people continue to support Project Imagine and support what we do. Awesome. So those those are my outreach workers, and they, I mean they just do a great great job. So if you're going to uh, hire a project coordinator, uh, the role is vital to the program because it's got to be full time because it requires a lot of time and energy. Uh, they must have the authority to perform their duties uh, because you can't give them responsibility without authority. And the coordinator must uh, have the necessary time to coordinate project objectives and accomplish all their duties uh, because. Without being able to to navigate the systems, it's, it's going to be hard to accomplish the goals. Next slide, please. Uh, ideal skills, ability to understand and work with complex systems, because you're going to be, have to work with the school system, municipalities, law enforcement. You have to have the ability to kind of maneuver uh, those systems. You have to have the ability to develop actionable short-term, long-term plans because some things you're going to have to have some quick wins and come in and win quickly to win over the community. And then there's other things that are going to be long-term. Basic understanding of data collection analysis and interp uh, interpretation. I mean, it's data-driven. You gotta you gotta have that data in order to prove that you, you're doing what the work is really effective. Uh, gotta have the flexibility uh, to be able to, to do the task. This is not a nine to five job. Uh, they have to be able to uh, be flexible and you got to have people skills, a conflict resolution. I always say uh, you have to be able to uh, communicate from cornbread to caviar uh, because uh, in this position, you're going to be dealing with people uh, in the community as well as some, sometimes, you know, city councilmen and things like that. Next slide, please. So uh, you have to have a, a project, uh, project assessment plan and implementation and monitoring. Uh, that's what's involved. Uh, the perceived problem is not always the problem. So uh, it's advisable to get an assessment of the city to find out what's really going on as opposed to what we think is going on. Uh, information sharing with agencies. Again, you gotta be able to communicate. Uh, staff and client safety protocol. Each city is gonna have a different protocol. One of the things that we did was uh, uh, I could collaborate with uh, the law enforcement and as uh, I got the outreach workers, I, I asked them to say, uh, let me know, okay, when you're going to be doing something over on that side of town, a bus or whatever, let us know because I don't need my people getting caught up in that. And they don't tell us exactly where, they would just say maybe on the west side. And so I'll just tell my staff, you know, don't go over there today. Uh, maintain the focus on overall goals and objectives. The key is, you know, decrease gang violence and decrease uh, death. So you, you got you to gotta keep that to the forefront. Next slide, please. So day-to-day -day administration, there's some paperwork involved in that and things of that, of course. Uh, maintaining a relationship with community stakeholders. Uh, there's a lot of Zoom meetings, a lot of face-to-face -face meetings in order to collaborate and get the resources that you need. Uh, handling sensitive issues. You may be handling something that uh, sensitive from the city council or uh, the chief of police all the way down to something that happened in the community and dealing with the matriarch or the patriarch of the community. You have to be willing to uh, understand how to deal with that mediating problems related to the project, uh, just the functionality of it, things don't go your way, might be facility usage, uh, and got to follow with clients. One of the things we do is uh, after we, we take them through phases as they achieve their goals, and the, and the last phase is we maintain, if they're in the program for a year, we'll still maintain contact with them another year through telephone, just doing checking up, see if they need us. Next slide, please. Uh, structure to support the project management. Got to have a strategic plan because that's the map. That's the roadmap. You got to know where you're going. Regular scheduled meetings. I meet with my staff every Friday. A memorandum of understanding, data sharing. Uh, that's to, for, for everybody so that each organization knows what the other one is doing and that we can share data without uh, the risk of uh, breaching confidentiality and things like that. It's just basic structure of, of the program. Monitoring tracking mechanism. We use a program called LORIS. Uh, it was uh, kind of a, a Medicaid billing program, but they custom made it for us. Uh, not, not very expensive software. They keep the information on the cloud. Um, my staff can use their phones to, to type in notes and things like that, input uh, referrals. So it works really well. And data reports. Uh, you got to be able to have those data reports to go over them and look. It's part of the map. Where are you going? The data is going to tell you what direction you're going and if you need to tweak anything. Next slide. Be honest, flexible, and responsible. There's no way around it. They, they will see you 
uh, coming if you're not transparent. My, my advice is don't try to be anything that you're not. And as, as my staff tell me, know your role. And, <laughs> and that's what we do. I let them do what they're best at and I do what I'm best at. And, and I don't try to infringe on uh, their, 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 their connections that they've been developing for the last 30 years. Uh, so you have to be uh, flexible and respond to the, their request. Uh, have re reasonable expectations, of course, and talk to others if I implement a similar program, always reaching out and, and finding maybe other cities or entities and just talking to people, finding out you know, what's going on, what worked, uh, something similar, if you're doing a similar program, what worked, and be aware and be prepared. Next slide. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for the presentation. That was outstanding. And I'm going to ask you to join the panel discussion as well. But um, thank you for sharing everything about your uh, initiative. And you'll be able to expand on it in this next um, next session, next part of the webinar. Um, so with that, um, I would like to introduce to you our uh, other panelists. Uh, first of all, Amber Govan. Um, Amber has led model demonstration research projects and, um, and created initiatives and programs for several governmental agencies and community organizations in the state of Arkansas for the past 14 years. She is founder and executive director of Carter's Crew, a nonprofit organization that works with teens ages 12 to 17, as well as parents. Um, in the central Arkansas area. She also serves as the project director of their gang intervention suppression program, Unrepeating the Cycle. Amber's specialties include designing and implementing community programming that targets youth at risk for gang involvement and are already gang affiliated. So welcome, Amber. And um, is there anything else you'd like to, if there's anything else you'd like to expand upon that I have not covered, I'll let you do that right after I introduce Tracy. All right. And so now I have the honor of introducing Tracy Swan. And since April 2021, Tracy Swan has served as a public safety reform strategist. I love the name of that, um, in Cumberland County. She works to help the county reimagine public safety and uh, through a broader public health lens, Tracy leads the gang and violence reduction initiative in the office, as well as its positive youth development efforts, and will now also be leading its newly funded mental health diversion program. Tracy spent the past 17 years at the Rand Institute for Public Affairs at Red Rutgers University Camden, most recently leading the strategic initiative department. She managed a diverse portfolio of projects, including program evaluations, needs assessments, and technical assistance and capacity building initiatives. So welcome, Tracy. Uh, and with that, Amber, would you like to expand on your, uh, please expand on your um, introduction, if you would, and then Tracy, for you the same. Thanks, Celeste. Um, I thank you pretty much. Um, covered everything and I'm going to apologize in advance because I'm a little under the weather today. Um, but our uh, youth program Unrepeating the Cycle um, is a 10 week intensive program um, and we target those youth who are um, at risk for gang affiliation or who are coming out of uh, areas that are identified as hotspots for criminal activity. Um, we provide them with a lot of intensive services that include uh, case management, uh, mentoring, career readiness, uh, family nights, um, as well as uh, aggression replacement training. Um, and so uh, that's just a little bit more uh, detail about our program. And I think you covered everything else, Celeste. All right. Thank you, Amber. Tracy? I think the only thing that I would add is um, I've become uh, somewhat of the grant writer over here um, at the prosecutor's office. 
even before I was here and I was at Rutgers, we worked, we partnered with the prosecutor's office and uh, the county on several uh, crime reduction public safety initiatives and helped them write grants. So I think overall, um, it's probably somewhere in the range of maybe almost $4 million that we've been able to help um, the prosecutor's office bring in. I haven't even been here a year yet, and I've already written six grants, and five of the six have been funded. So we've got a lot of lot of uh, work to be done. Okay. Okay. With that, I think there'll probably be more questions and comments. And as you talk, I think there'll be more um, more interest in in both of what you're <laughs> what you're doing, including Robert. So thank you for sharing that, Tracy. Well, we're going to go ahead and get into the questions. And uh, as I mentioned, Robert, um, I'm glad you're joining the panel as well. So. Um, the first question is who's the lead agency for your violence reduction initiative in your community? And then how does its infrastructure support the initiative? So it's a, it's a two part question. Um, and um, why don't we go ahead and start with um, you, Tracy. Um, okay, so I know that we don't have tons and tons of time. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about our comprehensive anti-gang initiative. Um, but if anyone's interested, you could reach out to me separately and I would love to talk to you about it. Um, but uh, we here at the prosecutor's office, we are the lead administrative, programmatic and fiscal organization of our anti-gang um, initiative, which we call CC Inc. And um, you may be thinking, why would the prosecutor's office be a lead? Don't you guys just lock people up? Um, well, we found over the last several years, we have found the prosecutor's office has really found itself as one of the only organizations in the county with the capacity to kind of lead in this space of anti-violence, anti-gang. Doesn't mean other people weren't doing work around this, but they didn't necessarily have the capacity to bring a large swath of stakeholders together to look at the problem in a more comprehensive manner and they didn't have the capacity to go after federal funding. So we kind of stepped into that space um, to lead to bring uh, resources to the county to address um, gang and violence. Um, and we also tended to be one of the organizations who, believe it or not, even though we're at prosecutor's office, who tend to be a little bit more innovative in our thinking of how to approach public safety. So we have a very um, supportive prosecutor um, and innovative in terms of how prosecutors go and looks at how we need to have a much broader view, a public health approach, a much broader view of how we deal with um, public safety issues in our community. We also had um, experience and history since 2009 of uh, bringing together the right partners to address juvenile crime um, in our county and uh, create a multidisciplinary problem solving collaborative um, that has been working on this and has done amazing work. So we had this foundation already of bringing all these stakeholders together to look at data, to define the problem, to design strategies, to address the problem, to evaluate how we were doing. And it just kind of made sense that we would step up and be lead, you know, in other, um, in other areas like anti-gang and violence. Um, so our office, myself, we will lead some of the programmatic um, elements of our anti-gang initiative and we'll RFP out to others um, so that they can lead some of our programmatic um, elements. And one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to use um, the county's fledgling credible messenger program that we had funded through a previous grant, giving them a little bit of money to start a credible messenger program. They had already been doing this work in the community without getting um, any formal recognition or payment, and they had really great results. So we wanted to work with them in our anti-gang program, but being the lead law enforcement agency in the county, we, and we saw that there could be some issues of being the one to fund the credible messenger program and kind of be perceived as like in bed with these credible messengers. And also the credible, the nonprofit that uh, ran the credible messenger program, you know, wasn't super organized or structured. So, um, you know, I had a charge from the prosecutor, like we need to mitigate our risk 
of being involved um, with a credible messenger type program. And uh, on the credible messenger side, you know, I also had to gain their trust in why should we partner with law enforcement? Um, so I spent the last seven months, you know, working to create the infrastructure of that nonprofit. I probably had 20 different planning meetings with them over the last um, seven months. I conducted research about a bunch of other credible messenger programs. We had a meeting with Robert to learn about what's going on in Danville um, and many others. Um, and so that they could also hear how the programs are organized um, and that there needs to be some structure to the program. I wrote the credible messenger eligibility requirements. I saw there was a question in the Q&A about that. I'm sure Robert's got information that he can share. I can share ours. I surveyed a bunch of different um, programs that were doing this, got their eligibility and kind of created what was gonna be best for us. I wrote job descriptions for them. I created an online application for them to get their uh, credible messengers actually to uh, officially apply. Uh, we created a hiring process that did involve being vetted by law enforcement and then going through a background check. Um, and I spent countless hours investigating an appropriate but reasonably priced train to train our credible messengers. Um, and I was able, I'm, there's some people on this, so I'm gonna give them a, a shout out from Hudson County. Um, they are um, training our credible messengers and they are doing a tremendous job. On the law enforcement side, I had to bring them along as well to be like, cause I had all these detectives and law enforcement people in the prosecutor's office saying to the prosecutor, why are we doing this? Why is Tracy calling me about what's going on in this place and that place um, in the community? So I had to present about the Credible Messenger Program um, and all the safeguards that we were putting in place to ensure as best we could that the Credible Messengers were appropriate and hopefully that they won't mess up. But we know from talking to all other Credible Messenger Program, you're probably gonna get some you know, mess ups. And that's just part of the territory. Um, so present to them to get their buy-in. Um, and I also had them sit in on meetings with other uh, credible messenger type programs to hear from law enforcement, their perspective of how great um, it is to do a program that is worth the risk to do. Um, so the only thing I wanted to point out is um, one of the slides that Celeste went over about lead agencies and she had the prosecutor's office. So all of the things that were in there as disadvantages are true. Um, and I've had to manage that um, to be able to, to see this through. And uh, we are in the process now of hiring a person who does have lived experience, who's gonna be the lead case manager on the anti-gang um, grant. And uh, I'll be working with him to design that case management process um, along with all the forms and the tracking and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so you can kind of tell by that little bit that I shared with you that we will manage certain aspects of our grant, of our program, and then we're gonna RFP out to others. And we're about to RFP out to recruit a credible messenger program to help us with identifying the youth that are appropriate to be in this program, to notify them and to mentor them. So in order for me to do that and have the prosecutor's blessing, I needed to ensure that um, the credible messenger program that existed in the county was poised um, appropriately to be able to apply uh, for this grant. So that's it for me on um, who's the lead agency. That, that's Thank you so much for the overview, Tracy. Thank you, that was great. Um, Amber, same question for you. Who's yeah. the lead Yeah. So uh, for us, um, the nonprofit Carter's Crew is the lead agency. And that's just because of the distrust that some people, a lot of people in the community have for the different governmental agencies, as well as law enforcement. Um, we have worked with the university as well as other state organizations to implement 
um, major model demonstration projects as well as research projects. So we already have the support of um, a lot of the governmental agencies um, based on the work that we've done previously um, under other initiatives. And so when, um, when we started this initiative, the thing that uh, I have been doing as the lead, um, I know Tracy spoke to the fact that um, she didn't have the support based on um, from people uh, with lived experience, but um, for myself, uh, I am one of those, uh, I was one of those youth uh, who was labeled at risk. And um, so I do have the lived experience. And so that is a part of why people buy into uh, what we're doing is because I was one of those kids and I was able to make changes to my life um, and still be respected in the streets. So I, we do a lot of outreach as well, um, but going out into the streets is, is very important. Um, outreach is gonna be a big thing to um, get the buy-in of the community as well as those uh, that demographic that you're trying to reach. So um, for this, we are the lead agency um, and the, the infrastructure that we have right now works well for us because we don't have the same um, red tape to cross as government agency. So I might need an outreach um, worker hired in two weeks and I most definitely can do it. Whereas Tracy, I know it would take her longer. Um, and so that is a good part of um, us being a nonprofit uh, agency and not having that same uh, those same restrictions. Um, what I've been doing for the past almost two years now is um, not only um, making uh, relationships with uh, government agencies and other organizations in our county, um, but I've also been reaching out to surrounding counties. And I actually saw Judge Brown, I see you on here, uh, from Pine Bluff. Um, so it's very important that, you know, we're not only working in our county, but we are also reaching out and uh, offering assistance to the other um, agencies that are surrounding our county as well. Um, and so that, uh, that infrastructure that we have right now works well for us, um, again, because uh, we have the trust of the community based on our outreach and our outreach events that we do in the community. Um, so that they already know that um, we come in and we do the good work and we provide them with some of the essential items that they need. And so um, people who uh, witness violence or who are um, a part of gang activity are more likely to come and talk to someone from my team uh, rather than going and talking uh, to somebody in law enforcement. And so we are building those relationships to share that information um, about what's going on in the, in the community. That was great, Amber. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, as you can, as the audience can hear, there's two different perspectives, two different types of um, program structures, but um, but you've both been able to make them work very well. And, and, and that speaks to the local context also, how things can work differently, um, depending on where you are. So that thank you very much for that. Robert, same question for you. If you could just expand a little bit about your lead agency and then maybe a little bit about how it all kind of came together for you, because you've been doing this for a little bit. Yeah. The, the lead agency, uh, of course, is the city of Danville. Uh, I think I have some flexibility because I report initially I reported directly to the city manager. Uh, now I report to the deputy city city manager. So many times uh, when I went in uh, to contact other agencies, I had that 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 um, influence. So it made it a little easier to pull everyone together. Um, and so, as I said earlier, we, it was just just me and with that influence able to go in and connect with these other organizations who are already doing great work mm -hmm. and uh, letting them see the bigger picture. I think many entities uh, really want to be involved in, in, in this fight is they don't know their place. And it's, it's up to someone, project manager, whoever, to show them the vision of this is where you fit. Not everyone, as you said, Amber, can be out in, in the street. 
uh, as, as a young guy say, you got to be made for that. But there are places where you can benefit uh, by being in strategic spots and providing access uh, to certain areas. So uh, that's that's our infrastructure. So right now it's uh, deputy city manager, myself, and then I have three outreach workers. And those outreach workers uh, then kind of, uh, I'm not gonna say control the community, but they kind of survey the community and those volunteer in, in, in interrupters, they report to those guys. Uh, and so that's kind of the infrastructure. And so everything that we're building now is I'm not giving those individuals supervision over anything because ultimately it's on me. But what I am doing is I'm giving them the ability to uh, move on their vision and the things that they wanted to see done in the city for all these years and they didn't have the resources or the ability. Now I give them access as long as it stays within the boundaries of the structure and the strategic plan that we talked about. And so uh, that's why we're able to kind of, kind of to be creative and develop MOUs with people like Head Start. You would think, well, what do you, why do you know gang intervention need Head Start as a as a partner? Well, because if the mother's not working and the young man is out on the street hustling and banging in order to get money, and he has a younger sibling, if we get the younger sibling out of the house, and then we get the mother a job, then the young boy maybe want to be a, a young man as opposed to trying to be a man, and so with outreach workers, with that same structure, we're also able to uh, reach out and assist in getting the mother a job through programs here in the city, DS, I mean, DCC, Danville Community College, and, and things like that. So the, the infrastructure for us works really great coming out of uh, the city manager's office. I, I, not to go into the whole history of Danville, but Danville, Danville was somewhat of uh, probably number two behind, and this is documented, behind um, Birmingham in the 60s as far as you know racial injustice so there's a lot of distrust here which we've built it with the new chief and so if i would have came in under the police department uh at least here i wouldn't have been affected because uh, i would have automatically been pegged as being an informant i mean i, I tell you i know i had the police officer look but i'm not the police and mm -hmm. after <laughs> after about six or seven months being here a guy i've been talking to every day came to me and said hey when are you leaving you're the feds aren't you so you got to know, <laughs> you yeah. got to know, yeah, you got to right. know your environment and, and the city yeah. you're working in, yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. And thank you for, thank you for sharing that because I think that's, uh, that'll probably resonate with people in the, in the audience as well. So thank you. Um, so, um, who, so who, are we on the next? Yeah. So who handles the financial aspects of the program? And um, if the if the project coordinator against this two part question, if the project coordinator is responsible for the program's financial management, how does this impact day to day operations? So let's start with you this time, Amber. And I know I know your voice, yeah, so I appreciate you struggling through this. So, um, but let's start with you this time. Yeah. So um, we handle our uh, financial aspects. We do have a third party uh, accounting firm who um, takes care of all of our uh, financial dashboard and, and records, um, but uh, they still lean on me uh, to categorize those different things. Um, and I'll just tell you right now, like being a um, nonprofit organization um, and leaning on the support of an accounting firm, um, I work a hundred hour a week sometimes um, just because it's important to me that I'm not only uh, making sure that our accounting firm has a good idea of where we're going with our financial dashboard, um, but also that I'm able to uh, do the day to day things with not only the families, but with the people in the community, as well as meeting with um, other organizations um, and stakeholders. And so um, it does impact my day. Some days are long, a lot longer than others, um, but this is very important to me just because, like I said, I do have that lived experience and I have uh, needed this support uh, when I was a teenager and a young adult. And so um, it's, it's a lot of work, um, but with our uh, third party accounting firm, it takes some of the pressure off of me, um, just, you know, just kind of following up with uh, how they're doing it. Um, but outside of that, you know, it makes for some, some long days when I have to meet with them as well, so. 
I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think that is a key too with working in your in a community-based organization, the long hours, the multiple roles that you play. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Amber. Um, Tracy, how about you? Um, so for me, uh, being at the county, um, and it's interesting coming from Rutgers University, which is a huge university, and I thought they had bureaucracy like no other. Well, I should have bit my tongue because now I'm at the at county government, and um, it's it's worse bureaucracy. Um, just to give you an idea, um, the other day I was telling Celeste this. The other day I was trying to purchase a website, a URL, a URL for nine dollars and ninety nine cents. And I probably spent about two hours on this and countless emails. And I finally got to the point where I'm like, I'll just buy it myself. It's $10. Um, so there are so many rules and regulations um, in county government following New Jersey's purchasing and procurement laws um, that it does make, uh, we're, we're, we're certainly not swift in, um, whether we want to RFP out money or even, we're pretty good about paying bills. Actually, they're very good about paying bills, but you you have to follow the process. You know, you have to uh, provide all the necessary information. And the other thing that I've learned um, coming to the county um, that seems a little weird for me uh, is that it looks like every department kind of handles their grant separately from the overall county um, finance department. So we have bookkeepers here who will, you know, produce um, purchase uh, orders and purchase vouchers. I have to receive the information from who we want um, to reimburse for their services, uh, review it, approve it, you know, do our own like budgeting and tracking of what we've spent. It just, it, it doesn't seem like it's the most effective um an efficient way of doing it um but so for me um i'm learning that so that's taking extra time and so and also because <clears throat> excuse me also because it's not the main focus of the job of my job i'll it, i'll tend to kind of um push it off to like you know one day we're okay now i have to address all of these things um the other piece that I wanted to mention is that um, since I am funded across several grants, um, I have to track my time. And so I'm averaging on this anti-gang, which is gonna be different than Robert because he's the full-time project coordinator, but I'm averaging um, anywhere between, and we haven't started yet. <laughs> so I'm averaging anywhere between 20 and 30% of my time on this particular grant. So that is also kind of a, a, a another piece of, of the financial is tracking all of your time. Good point. That's a good point. Yeah, a lot, a lot goes into that. Um, managing the time and the reporting is, is very different. Yes. So thank you for sharing that, Tracy. Um, Robert? Well, fortunately, uh, being in the city, finance <laughs> handles all keeping up with the money and I mean, uh, as as far as purchasing and things like that, I have to provide receipts and things uh, and those things. Now, as far as procuring the money, I have to write the grants. So uh, that's time consuming, collecting the data and things like that. So uh, on, on that end, it's not not too bad. I just uh, take my receipts and everything, and I give them to the secretary, and she takes care of whatever purchases and invoices. Uh, but the, the negative side to that is. Uh, which I found out through like reporting when you have to report the grants, if they don't feel like attending the trainings or if they're not keeping up with their performance reports, then, you know, that causes the issue because they're not in my department. I don't supervise them. And so I don't, you know, when I go on to look and see, did you do the financial performance report and, you know, you, you haven't done it, then you have to kind of, uh, you have to be that guy. <laughs> Got to manage, manage yeah. across departments. Yeah, you have to CC. You have to CC the supervisors because you know in a different department, and we do special work. We all do in this field, and sometimes they don't understand that. 
a lag in finances equates to bodies in the street. Mm-hmm. And so it's just another grant maybe to them because they do it all day, but to us it's serious. And so uh, that's the negative side of it. Plus side is I don't have to deal with all the numbers and, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's a good point because it's advantages and, and disadvantages. And sometimes it uh, it's nice to not have to be able to have to do the reports, but at the same time, you don't have the control or the ability to make sure things get done, like you said. So that's a, that's a really good point. And, and I think all of you are in charge of the grant writing for your, for if, you're, if you're planning to apply for any grants, um, pretty sure from all my conversations with you that you're all in charge of grant writing, which is another responsibility on top of everything else you're doing. So yeah, that's a good point. Well, we're up to our, our last question here that we have before we get to any, if we have time for any of the audience questions, but if there were one piece of advice you could give other project coordinators, what would it be? And you, if you have two pieces of advice, that's fine too. So um, why don't we go ahead and um, start here. Um, I'll start with you, Robert. What, what piece of advice would you give? I think we mentioned it in, this, in the slide presentation. Be honest, be transparent. And if you don't have passion, please don't do the job. <laughs> this, is, this is not a nine to five. This is not something that you can leave at home. You really have to be passionate uh, about the work that you do because that'll drive you because there's a lot of things that can uh, burn you out if you're really not sold out on on doing this work Uh, and just be transparent be honest Mm -hmm. that's great yes thank you for that amber well i agree with everything robert said but also to add to that um I would say to build a supportive network of people who believe in what you are trying to achieve. Um, Because what I found is, um, even though I already have relationships from working with uh, the government agencies already for the past 14 years, there were some doors that I had an issue to to get open. And um, through the support of the people who I had built in my network, Um, we were able to get those doors open uh, to begin the conversations about what we were doing um, with this gang model. And so um, my piece of advice would just to be, uh, have a supportive network of people. Great, thank you, Amber, that's good advice. How about you, Tracy? So I have two pieces of advice. Um, The first, um, and it kind of goes with my presentation about being the lead agency is to take the time necessary to design a well thought out strategy or program because it will definitely pay off in the results that you're able to achieve. And Celeste has been great about if I'm feeling anxious, like well, we haven't served any kids yet, we haven't served any kids yet for, for her to be at look, but you're building the necessary foundation in order to do it well. So that is one piece. Um, of advice I have. The other is perseverance. Um, And what I mean by that is um, if you really believe, like I believed in having a credible messenger program in this county, um, then, and you know it's the right thing, it's the the absolute right strategy for your particular area, that you kind of will it into existence. So I've been talking about credible messenger um, program for five years. And we just started doing it in the in the last year. Um, so I talked about it in every possible venue that I could talk about. I brought research. I brought um, data in terms of accomplishments. I mean, it's probably also helped recently that the Biden administration has been very vocal about community um, um, intervention types of programs. And there's funding more for violence interruption programs. And so it's kind of like the perfect storm. Um, But, you know, don't give up on your dream. Um, If you really believe that it's the right thing for your community, just will it into existence. Thank you so much for that. You know, and all one thing I, um, you know, as you, all three of you as panelists, I mean, you may come from different perspectives, different places, you're in different regions, but the one thing that's very clear throughout these, uh, this panel discussion is you're very passionate about the work. 
and you're very focused and very driven. And um, and I saw something in the comment about the passionate being passionate about the work, the work. And I think that really is key. And it it um, and you're all very competent as well. I mean, that's 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 clear. But you're you're very strategic. Uh, but but the passion is the one thing that really just shines through. And I think that that is really a good takeaway. And many of the people that are on this call today, I think, are on the call and, and in, on this webinar today because they are passionate about this work, too. So I don't know. Do we have any time for questions, Sterling? Excellent. I think we have time to take one or two questions from the audience. And again, to anyone that has shared a great question, I've seen a lot come in. If there's something we do not address during this open Q&A part, you are welcome to reach out to the National Gang Center information at nationalgangcenter.gov and we will try to help you. But yes, Celeste, we can go ahead with one or two questions. Okay, would these be all be in the chat box? Um, okay, so one of the questions here is, have, have you all had any safe, safety concerns? And I think this comes up quite often too, have any safety concerns in implementing services in the hotspots? Um, the person says we have an, one area that is somewhat aggressive towards our law enforcement agencies. So who would like to take that question? Um, I can I can take it. Uh, we don't really we don't really get pushback from people in the community, um, more so even the gang members, um, just because we have this. Uh, open communication with some of the higher up uh, gang members. So, you know, I can say that my outreach team will be on this street on this day and uh, that gang won't be on that street um, while my people are in the area. So um, just again, the credible messengers making those um, connections with uh, the people who are out in the community, um, that is going to be very, very important, and they're going to need to trust you um, as well. And so um, coming up with innovative ideas, um, our idea was uh, just doing these community giveaways um, that we not only incorporate uh, providing the people and families in that community with essential items that household items that we know that they need, but also providing them with education. And so my people are out walking the streets and making those connections. And me as the leader of the organization, I'm also out making those connections with those uh, gang members, those kids who are at risk for gang membership um, mm -hmm. as well. And so that's going to be very important um, is to come with something different, uh, an innovative idea to reach them. Um, because once you have their buy-in, uh, they're going to be very supportive of you and uh, they're going to take care of you uh, while you are out in that community. Um, even for me, as being a woman, I can go um, into the hood and uh, some of the kids usually know me uh, when I pull up at the gas station and they won't leave until I get in my car. And that's just because I've built this trust with them and they know me and they want to take care of, of me and my people when we're out. And so I think it's important to um, build those, those relationships with um, the people who are out there in the front line. That's a great, great comment. And it's being out there and being connected to the community. I that you're talking about, Amber. So people yes. actually have trust in you um, and what the work you're doing. So that's a great, great point. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, so, so there is a question about uh, one of the per, one of the people asked. Our state has a has placed a heavy emphasis on trauma informed care, which emphasizes the use of, use of ACEs with delinquent youth. Do any of the panelists implement the ACE? questionnaire when dealing with, with with individuals and does that influence the intervention process? So currently uh, for my organization, we don't. We do have other assessments as well as a gang assessment um, um, that we do with them to see how at risk they are for gang affiliation or if they are um, already gang affiliated. Um, so we do 
do some assessments, but right now we do not implement uh, ACEs into our assessment with the families. Oh, oh thank you. Amber. Neither do neither do we. We do clips and strength based assessment, life skills. Uh, if, if that comes up, we will refer them to someone. And and you have to just kind of a side note. You have to be careful that initially using something like that going into the community and not really being known. You have to be sensitive to the needs of the community uh, and, and the population that you're dealing with. Automatically dropping mm -hmm. the ACES assessment on them and you don't know them, that will cause, you know, with a, time. A level of distrust. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. With trust, you can build build up to providing different types of uh, right. assessments. And, and, and so the, the view of you is a little bit different, right? So right. building that relationship is really key in this beginning stages and that's a really good point thank you for that well we took two questions I'll, we're i'll just celeste i'll just add to that that yeah. it's probably fair to assume that the youth that you're going to be working with have aces yeah um and so through any kind of other assessment that you're doing um whether it's a, a as robert mentioned a strength-based assessment uh gang assessment you know, you will you will get to that information without having to use the ACEs um, assessment. We got another federal grant that is all about trauma, and so and and we're working on figuring out what that grant is going to be offering. But because we have that grant, there could be some crossover in terms of if we're going to be supporting specific trauma based counseling or interventions in the community where youth that are part of the anti-gang initiative could take advantage of that as well. Thank you. That's a great comment as well, Tracy. Thank you for that. Well, um, as we wrap up, we're, we are running, um, we're running close to the hour here to the, the end of the webinar, but last comments, any final comments that you'd like to share? Tracy? Well, um, I was going to say, and this is not to pat myself on the back. I was just going to say how it um, that the the fruit of spending your time setting up the infrastructure. Um, and somebody in one of the comments or Q and A's asked, like they were starting from scratch. What do they need to do? So this um, uh, nonprofit that is running that I work to create this more structured credible messenger program. So almost like working from scratch, but they had been doing some violence interruption case management previously. They were able um, to apply for a state attorney general's grant um, and work with us to shore up the proposal. And they just recently received, they were awarded $430,000 to do credible messenger in the county. Um, so it can be done and it is important to um take the time to build the program and do it right and because they had done that they were able to say we have all of these things in place which is what a state attorney general's office is going to be looking for because they're not going to want to invest in um, a, a more fledgling um, organization um, and even though they are very kind of fledgling they were able to demonstrate that they have some infrastructure in place and can handle a four hundred thirty thousand dollar grant that's a great point. Thank you for sharing that, Tracy. Amber? Yeah, um, I just want to encourage everybody, if it's, it's something that you believe in, to continue fighting for it because, I mean, we were all volunteers, um, but we are two years in and we have three full-time positions and six part-time positions. And we've secured over close to $1 million in the past uh, one and a half years um, because people uh, recognize that the work we are doing uh, has been good. And so we continue to build upon that. Um, it, but it took us a little bit longer to get started, but um, don't give up. Uh, and if I can be of assistance, you know, I'm always available. Thank you, Amber. Thank you. That's amazing. Robert? Yeah, just be uh, diligent in your efforts. You have to always remember that, you know, we look sometimes we look at the, the, the deaths as numbers one and two, but those one and twos as somebody's child, somebody's baby. 
So regardless how big, how small your organization is, if you stop one person from laying in the street, then you've been successful. Don't get caught up on the numbers or the size. It's about the impact. And I promise you that one person that you save, their parents will appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Just be diligent. That's, that's an excellent, excellent point. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And I want to thank all our panelists. Uh, Robert David, thank you very much. Amber Govan, I want to thank you as well. And Tracy Swan, thank you all. You, it was an outstanding panel presentation. I want to thank the, the participants of the webinar. And I want to thank the NGC team for, um, for, the, for putting this together. And of last but not least, and of course, most importantly, OJJDP for sponsoring this, uh, this webinar. So I'll turn it over to you, Tracy, or to you, Sterling, excuse me, Sterling, go ahead. Thank you all again for such a great webinar. So as a reminder, if you do have any questions that were not addressed today or are in need in any additional resources, you can reach out to the National Gang Center at our email address or website. Um, actually, through their webinar registrations, I saw a lot of interest in better understanding youth gang involvement and strategies to respond, as well as outreach programs. And on those topics, I would recommend checking out some of our previous webinars in the series on the National Gang Center YouTube channel. Um, as well, also any future learning opportunities on the topic that come through the National Gang Center, we will be sure to notify you about via email. So at this time, for anyone still remaining, we ask you to take a couple minutes to complete the feedback form coming up on your screen. You can complete it by scanning this QR code with your smartphone or by clicking the link provided in the chat box. You may also be directed to it once you leave the webinar. The survey is completely anonymous and provides us with some incredibly valuable information to guide our work. Also, if you would like to receive a certificate for your attendance today, we ask that you complete the survey. And upon completion, you will be directed to a form where you can make that request. So we'll leave this link open for a few minutes so everyone can take time to complete it. But just once again, we would like to thank you all for joining us and thank again our panelists and presenters for such a great discussion today. So this will now conclude our webinar. Have a great afternoon.